up with the next presenter. My friend Jerry Crispin, who is uh, bashfully waiting at the back of the room. That's the last bashfulness that you'll probably see out of Jerry for the rest of the day. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing Jerry for probably 15 years, maybe more. Um, Jerry did one of the greatest things for me, um, and you've heard this before. Probably in like 1998 or 1999, Jerry and his business partner um, were putting out these books when they were, were a whopping maybe 200 job boards worldwide. And Jerry put out a book kind of reviewing them. And he just trash talked me in, in one of these books. Um, and it was great. If you've ever had somebody be brutally honest with you, and then it helps, helps you really improve, Jerry did that for me. So I've, was I? I was ticked off. Well, that's, that's, that's also a growth opportunity then, isn't it? Um, so Jerry, is, um, I've had the pleasure of working um, with him in a volunteer capacity in the last couple of years on an effort that he um, got started and he's going to be speaking about for the next 20 minutes um, on a, uh, the Candidate Experience Awards, um, basically the, the organization that Jerry helped to kickstart and that I did some volunteering work, uh, we're trying to get employers to improve their candidate experience. It's good for, I think, morally. It's also good for the employer's bottom line. It's good for the candidate. Um, and we're trying to use a lot more carrot than stick for probably the first time in history. So, Jerry, you are up. Cool, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. That's not bad. That's not too bad. You have one of those clickers? It's great. Look at how that thing worked. Didn't work so good. Um, hopefully, the other slides will be less uh, squeezed or scrunched, what have you. So I want to take you on an adventure. I want to share with you some opinions, some observations, and some fresh data. Because I'm a data geek. So I'm taking this candidate experience and I really want to engage you around what we know as opposed to what we think or believe. That's a critical issue and a critical difference because I am a fan of what Ellen just talked about. That there is in fact a paradox we tend to think that we have to satisfy the employer when in fact what we really have to do is better understand what the candidate really needs to make better decisions. But we're going to have to prove it. We're going to have to build a business case that shows that by doing that our companies will benefit. That there will be major rewards for us if we do that well. And that's going to be where that key issue is. And we're not going to resolve it unless we collect that data. So I want to do three things. One, I want to talk to you about how I collected some of this data with a lot of volunteers, including several people in this room who've been active in the UK. We're now creating some stuff in New Zealand and Australia, as well as Europe around that. But I'm going to focus on the US. Uh, the second thing I want to do is give you some of that data that has yet to be published. In fact, there's going to be a major white paper probably around uh, mid-January that will be up. It will be free. And I'm going to show you a couple of the pieces of data that we're collecting around outcomes uh, for what this candidate experience uh, portends. And the last piece is maybe just a couple pieces of learning. And this is more broadly uh, done than just college, but I have a couple comments around college. And I will tell you that we're, we have enough data that we can cut and slice college and take a look at that because we actually have several thousand candidates from college who, will be able, who have uh, supplied us with that data. So that's kind of what I'm going to do over the next 20 minutes. Everybody good with that? OK, cool. So now let's see if this works this way. Yeah, OK. So let me, let me give you about how I collected the data. It wasn't just me. There's a whole bunch of volunteers. About three years ago, some friends of mine basically called me and said, we've been, we've been just ripping apart companies for years about their candidate experience. Maybe what we should do is find the companies that are doing an extraordinary work and out them and tell their stories and engage them and collect some data and share that and create a benchmark and some standards around that. So we've been doing that now for three years and I'm going to tell you how it went because it took about four months during 2013. We basically went to companies and said, hey, are you ready to share with us what you do that you think impacts the candidate's experience? 
And in the end, hundreds of companies came to the door, looked at the survey, and, and said, oh no, we're not going there. Many of them left. But 138 of them attempted to complete the survey. And it was very extensive. It was a comprehensive survey about everything that you do from the point at which people are beginning to research you as a company to the point at which they're getting onboarded. So that's a lot of data to collect. Uh, 122 companies completed the survey, and then we asked them, do you want to go to the next step? The next step is you got to get your candidates, even the ones you don't hire, to confirm what you said is true. And that means they're going to have to engage in all of that information and tell you whether or not they're aware of it, whether they saw it, whether they had an impact on it, et cetera. And a number of those companies went to their lawyers and their PR departments and they said, mm -mm, we're not doing that. This is not going to happen. But of that group, about 97 joined that, that group and said they would do it. 92 of them completed that effort and actually got their candidates to accomplish that which I find fascinating. 92 companies went out to their candidates, whether they were college or interns, whether they're professional, whether they were executive, and said in a variety of different ways, and one company did it in groups of 100 candidates and experimented with different messages to determine which mes message would give them the biggest yield. I don't know if you think in your mind, how many candidates do you think they were able to get? In one month, 46,000 of their candidates completed a 40-minute survey detailing what they thought about that company that they had applied to. Fascinating amount of data. All of it was collected in September. We, we've got a group of volunteers who are engaged in completing that analysis right now. Um, and writing up that analysis. There are benchmark reports that are being sent to every single company that participated, uh, whether or not they were able to get candidates or not. So we gave them their information, their candidates if they had it, um, as well as the information of those companies whose candidates were positive. So we were able to create an algorithm and do it blindly on those 46,000 candidates to see which companies actually showed net positive, sort of like a net promoter score, but for candidates. And there were about 60 companies that were in that process. So we've got data around which practices these companies had that impacted that attitude and also impacted some of the downstream behaviors. I find that fascinating. Does everybody get that? Lots of data, we're in the process of looking at it. So what did we learn from some of that? And this is, by the way, some of the awards that were given out in October at the HR Technology Conference to the companies that had a net positive uh, impact. But I gotta tell you, I respect all the companies who participated because they're getting data that allows them to have a better understanding of what they can change to improve downstream. Unless you're willing to look in the mirror you can't possibly know what's important in a candidate's experience. You can't just pull that out of air. You need to understand it from how you collect data of those candidates themselves. So some of the candidates had extraordinary, extraordinary stories. These are some of them. Enterprise, for example, every single recruiter has on the website all of their contact information so you know what jobs they're, they're, they're uh, engaged in and you know how to reach them by phone, by email, by text, and you know even their address. Companies like Adidas um, actually bring their candidates into their recruiter training in order to improve the way in which they engage. Make the candidates then tell the recruiters face to face how they came across in terms of that interview. So I could go through a whole bunch of those. I'm not going to within the time frame. In that white paper report, we will go into that in a lot of detail. Um, so here's some 
bottom line stuff that comes in terms of outcomes. We ask the candidates, how likely are you to apply again? I mean, if you've got great candidates and you didn't give them a job, wouldn't you want them downstream? On the other hand, maybe there's some candidates you don't ever want to apply again. Um, and can you make that distinction? You know, it's an interesting set of issues. So there were tens of thousands of candidates who were positive and tens of thousands who were negative. On the positive side, the candidates who said they had a positive candidate experience were 62% more likely to apply again, extremely likely to apply again. So on, on a scale, they're on this end of the scale if you've got them as positive. On the negative side, if you didn't have a good experience, 24% were definitely not going to apply. Now this shouldn't be any shock to anyone, but what should be interesting is we've got numbers. Numbers that I can turn into dollars. I can make an estimate of the cost of not being able to get quality candidates to apply in the future, as well as the value of treating somebody well enough that downstream the cost of getting them back is lower and lower. That's really what collecting this data is all about. So that's, I think, pretty cool. We also asked them, how likely are you to change your status as a customer for those of you who actually sell stuff or provide services? Again, we split it up in terms of positive versus negative. 38% were at the extreme le uh, level of those who were positive said, I will increase my purchasing power. I will leverage that. I had such a good time, man. I'm going to buy your product. Now, there's obviously a lot of people who say, hey, it made no difference, right? But still, there's a dollar value to be assigned to that. And 30% of those who were negative said, I will take it somewhere else. And th those that do are going to cost you. And now I can estimate that cost. And remember now, each company has their own data. So they're able to examine that from that perspective. How likely are you to refer someone in the future? Again, powerful if you, in fact, are looking at the referrals of quality candidates who come in who are telling you that there's people like me who you should be hiring, whether or not I got the job. Powerful. And again, 61% of those who were positive said they were, they were likely to encourage somebody, they go out there and encourage people to apply. Those who were negative, 27% said I would actively discourage people from applying to your company. And I will tell you that over three years, the real cool thing here is we can show the trend and how fast it's growing. That's what's going to hit you down the road. This is growing faster and faster. Why? Because of all the things that Ellen was talking about, the social media, all the things you know are happening out there, are creating those impacts. How likely are you to share with your inner circle? And by the way, whether you're a boomer or a millennial, the likelihood is your inner circle is about the same, something between four and six people because we asked that question. So, so how likely are you to share with your inner circle? And if it was a positive experience, 82% share. If it was a negative experience, fewer, but still large number are sharing with their inner circle that they had a lousy experience or a great one. How likely are you to share your experience publicly? That's the one that's a killer, because now I have more ways to do that than ever before, right? So what's interesting about this one is the numbers are, are slightly lower, but they're double last year, which were double the year before, which were double the year before. So you got to start thinking about this. 
because that public implication is huge. We're not talking about just a few people learning. We're talking about large numbers. Now, by the way, one of the differences between millennials and boomers shows up here. The millennials are less likely to share negative experiences publicly. Now, I don't know why we're getting that, but no, but they're less likely. So to use social media to share a negative experience. But uh, I, uh, my rationale for this is that more and more of them are getting good coaching, that a young person probably is not really being very smart if they had a lousy experience and cry from the rooftops how bad, how much it sucked. Because down the road, the next place they're interviewing may in fact learn of that and say, you know, I don't want somebody who's whining all the time about what lousy experiences they have. The boomers, on the other hand, they're about done and they don't care. So they're much more likely to shout from the rooftops that this, you know, you're not treating me very well. So that's one of the possibilities down there. So what I'd like to do in sticking a fork in the road, was too early for this? What? <laughs> is just uh, identify a couple things that uh, I think we're learning from this. And, and clearly, when you go out there, you have exhibited a lot of practices. There's a lot of things that happen in your recruiting practice, particularly at a college level, from the intern, as Ellen pointed out, from internship all the way through. Um, but we're seeing that people will put up with a lot of frustration and upset and still view the experience as positive. We haven't done all the correlations yet, but I'm convinced there's a couple things that are going to be more important, more important than anything else. One of them is the extent to which you allow me, as a candidate, to tell you everything that I think I need to tell you to compete for this job. Now, what does that really mean? It means somewhere at the end of the application or at the interview, there has to be embedded some means for you as an employer to say, were you able to tell us everything you needed to tell us to compete effectively for this job? Is there anything that was missing? And if the answer is, oh, no, I really wanted to say something, whatever, you got to say, well, now's your chance. Now, some recruiters do that intuitively. I'm suggesting if the data shows that this is a high correlation to whether or not it's a negative or positive performance uh, experience, then you better make sure that your practices emphasize that because you can't afford the negative experience. You have, to, if you have to have the positive, right? And if that's a critical one, you want them to be able to do that. And that leads to that paradox thing. Who, who, what am I trying to do here? I'm trying to engage people in a way that, do you have all the information you need to make the best decision for yourself? Have you given us all the information you, you want to give us to show that you, in fact, are a viable candidate. The other, the other piece that becomes more and more important and that we're seeing out there is that there is a, um, an incredible desire on the part of the candidates to want to tell you what it was like being a candidate. And they want to know that you heard them. Now that's, I don't have to go through all this, that's active listening 101. That means that at some point in your process you have clearly identified practices in which you say, is there anything you need to tell us about what you just went through today in the interview process or in the application or in the research of the company? You need to be able to do that. And then when they say, yeah, and here's what I would suggest you do to improve, you need to say, so this is what you think we should do to improve. And they go, yes, right? That's active listening, is repeating back and getting some response. You do those two things, and I believe, I, we have yet to prove, but I believe that we will prove 
that those two things will do more to shift from negative to positive than any, any other practice that you have out there. So that's just an interesting issue. And the last pieces of this, build a business case to calculate and measure your return. I, I, if you haven't done that, how do you possibly imagine that you're going to improve your, your, your practice? You need to have the data that suggests ahead of time what you think you're going to get from that. You should be seeking feedback uh, from the stakeholders. I talked about that. You should increase transparency, which means telling the truth about it because people do know when you're not. So when somebody asks what it costs, when somebody asks what happened to the last person, when somebody asks how many people came into this job and actually were promoted or left, you need to have that number, those numbers in front of you, and you need to be able to answer them truthfully. Fourth is set expectations, make them public. Only two companies in the United States actually say, up front, if you apply to us, if you apply to us, here's what you can expect to happen from that point on. Only two companies. If you think that you do that, let me know because I'll go check your website to see if, in fact, it's up there. And finally, I think there is no substitute for everyone in this room not walking in their shoes at least once during the course of every quarter, but at least once in the course of every year. You should go and try and apply to your own company and see what that's like. I apply to between 200 and 500 companies every year under an assumed name because I, I don't want to tell them who I really am because I'm a little too old for most of your jobs. But the reality is um, under that assumed name, I want to find out how you react to me. Um, and that kind of data, there's just no substitute for doing it yourself. On that note, thank you very much. How do we do? Was that 20 minutes? That was great. <laughs> what? Let's see if there's any questions. Oh, Someone questions? I'll be around all day. Anybody have any questions right Yeah. OK. Hi, I'm Paula Challengage. Uh, my question is, at what stage in the process were the surveys given to ensure there are not biases in, in the outcomes? Oh, there's definitely biases in the outcome. We can't totally control those kinds of things. I could probably spend uh, a half an hour listing all of the biases that I think we're trying to, to deal with. Do I think some of them work themselves out? Yes, I do. Um, what we've attempted to do, first of all, is have a whole bunch of people who volunteered to take, who have um, survey design experience to be able to minimize the biases in terms of when and where that's being done. We ask the, the candidate, for example, when they come back to do the survey, the URL that they come from tell us exactly where they came from. Among the first questions are how far they got in the process, so, and whether or not the process still exists. So whether they're still waiting for, and so the bias might be, I don't want to say anything negative because I still don't know whether I'm going to have an interview. So I want, and I don't know whether they know us. Um, so we try to confirm that it is anonymous. We try to confirm that it is independent. We try to confirm that there is no connection directly to their name and those kinds of things to minimize bias and to understand where they are in the process. I don't know if that helps a little bit, but we go through all of that. But to be perfect about it, no. I, I don't think you can do any field study that's truly uh, meets all of the academic standards that you'd really want because things continue to move. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Got one back there? Uh -huh. Oh, here? Yeah? Wait, when you talked about um, the people being willing to either give negative or positive um, feed, not feedback in the survey, but to to, to either post something on, online. Did you get any idea of what type of reach they have? Did they give you any idea of what their social network? N no. So the answer is we did not examine, we have 46,000 people, we did not examine their social networks. On the other hand, um, the companies 
that are participating in this, in this, and I did not show because we didn't want to want to have that 75-minute kind of thing. The companies that that uh, are engaged, 50% of them are Fortune 500. The breakdown from uh, in terms of uh, who they are range from obviously thousands of college students to literally a thousand people who are applying to director and vice president level. So. We have an enormous range and a lot of professionals, so, so among them would be pe people who are truly um, connected. And I think it would probably be more representative of the population So uh, it, from that perspective. But I do not have that data, no. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, good, good morning, Dr. Crispin. Uh, my name is Jose Garcia. I'm with the New York chapter of the so Society for Human Resource Management. Cool. Um, and uh, my question, um, so you mentioned earlier about you're not sure why the boomers are more um, s socially outgoing in terms of their negative than the Gen Y. Yeah. Uh, there's an article called The Yuppie Generation that might give a clue, but basically what it says is that Gen Y is a, has su suffers from obsessive comparison disorder where everyone's trying to sh outgun everyone with the positive stuff in their life, so they don't want to post anything negative because it's more of a social pressure thing. Um, so that's Great. something. That's I like, thank you. Would you send me a note on that? Because when we write, you know, when we're doing an analysis, you get to the point where you can say, oh, and we can see this difference, but it's nice to have a couple alternative rationales for why that might be. You can't know, but you certainly can pose some of those different rationales. And th so thank you. Yeah. I do have one question. Um, yep. So when you talked about the key differentiators from negative to positive of giving people a chance to like really share you know, their experiences and listening to that, yep. how did you get that? Was that from the data or is that an instinct? So say that again. Your key, you mentioned two key differentiators, yeah. right, from negative to positive experiences. Yeah. Giving people a chance to really advocate for themselves at some point in the interview process or the application process. Oh, and, okay. Yeah. The, the answer is we collected that data. So we did ask among the 60, 70 questions that we asked candidates, we, we specifically asked them at each stage, and there were six different stages that we identified from a, from a a candidate point of view, One, the first being when they're researching the company, did they get the information that they needed, fully get it, and then if they give information as in the interview or in the, um, in the application, we ask them, did you, were you able to provide the information that, fully, that made you fully comfortable that you got everything in that you needed to? And so we were collecting data and we used a um, kind of a Likert scale, but by and large it was behaviorally anchored. So rather than, you know, one, two, three, four, five, we basically asked them for the most part, um, uh, we, we had an anchor against each of those in terms of behavior so they could compare to that. So, um, so we have that and what, what I can do, what we're in the process of doing if from a multivariate analysis is seeing if there is in fact a correlation between those practices, that practice, if you will, uh, or, or um, impact, and, and whether or not overall they were negative or positive uh, versus some of the other clusters of practices. And I'm, I'm convinced, just from my, my uh, view of that, that that is going to uh, be, uh, that's going to show up as a critical part of the cluster. Does that make sense? Okay. Thanks, Terry. Great. Thank Round you. of applause for Derek. <laughs> Dr. Crispin. I, I, I like the sound of that, Dr. The Crispin. in the back. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm delighted to. So thanks for that, Terry.